sort of start the story about four years ago, which is the point where I started doing freelance, uh, mostly social media related freelance training with NGOs, unions, voluntary organizations. And uh, noticed fairly quickly at that point that usually it took about five minutes into uh, any given workshop on social media I was running with organizational staff before people were complaining about managers. Uh, and this wasn't just a coincidence. <laughs> I started to see this coming up over and over again. And I don't think it was a coincidence that it would come up in those contexts. I don't think it's a coincidence that there's a digital leadership forum happening, discussing a lot of these questions here. I don't think it's a coincidence that the subtext to tons of the sessions that have, have happened in a whole range of ECF, uh, ECF uh, conferences I've been to uh, often revolve around this question of like, how can I get my managers out of the way? Because they really just don't get it. Um, and, uh, and so I think the thing that I started thinking about, one of the things that led me to write, uh, write the book, Anarchists in the Boardroom, that I've written, uh, has been a sort of a recognition that this is actually quite a deep and fundamental divide. This isn't just try and convince someone of a few things, then they'll get it, and then we can get on with work. There's quite a major difference, and there's, there are a lot of really strong reasons why management tends to get in the way of us using these tools very effectively in our organizations. Um, and uh, the conflict is not just a conflict between social change organizations and social media per se, it's reflective of a wider, wider issue, an issue of what happens when hierarchies and networks come together. Uh, and this is something that I've sort of talked about in, in the book uh, that, that I've written. This is a, a chart that I've called the management social media conflict, uh, which sort of highlights a range of the different assumptions under, uh, that, that underpin how social media works and how management structures work. And, this was an image that somebody tweeted about it. Uh, and if anybody wants to twit pick it now, it will add a whole weird meta level and the universe might collapse on itself. Um, but it's sort of things like management assumes decisions should be made by someone more senior than the person taking the action. Social media assumes decisions should be made by whoever is there to, take the, take the, uh, to make it. Uh, management assumes job titles and descriptions create a sense of order, which helps get things done. Uh, social media assumes job titles and descriptions prevent people from working to their, stra their strengths, passions, and interests. So there's a whole range of, of things like this that are sort of quite, quite deep divisions. And I, think, I don't think we tend to discuss these issues as the fundamental differences that they are. Uh, and thus, we, I think we tend to end up skirting around the, the uh, actually addressing these issues in, in more fundamental ways that would allow us to take better advantage of... Uh, of the, uh, of the tools that, that, that are available to us at the moment. Um, and so, so, yeah, so over the last four years of, uh, of working with organizations, primarily around social media and organizational change themes, um, I, uh, well, <laughs> I, that's sort of an interesting story in and of itself, because at a certain point I realized that, that uh, social media provided an inroad to having much wider discussions with organizations that there was usually a budget line for it, there was a skills audit that said, yes, social media training is something we need, and then I would come in there and work with people on self-organization and how do you subvert the bureaucracy that gets in the way of you doing your jobs most effectively. Uh, so I started calling my Trojan horse. This is what gets me in the door, but what I'm there to do is actually something quite different from just sort of teaching you how to use a bunch of tools that you probably know how to use already. Um, so I started noticing a, a pattern, though, that there were sort of three stages of kind of how organizations tend to use social media. Uh, and they'll probably, the first two will probably be quite familiar to you. I mean, this is, and these are all past that initial stage. I think not all, but the vast majority of organizations have moved beyond, which is the like total rejection and total close the doors, totally ignore social media kind of approach. Um, but yeah, there's sort of three stages once basic accounts are set up kind of thing uh, that, I've, that I've known. And these are crude, they're not, ex they're not sort of exact measures or exact definitions, but I think they provide something useful in the way of understanding what we could be getting out of these tools uh, and what we could be moving towards. So the first one I call the new fax machine. This is how 
Uh, this is sort of the first stage once the total rejection of social media has happened. Uh, it usually gets farmed, farmed off to a comms assistant, maybe an intern, somebody who has almost no decision-making power, probably has relatively little knowledge of a broader organization, uh, and so somebody who's basically just told, okay, you'll tweet as you're told once a week, and, uh, and don't question it, and don't try and take any initiative with it. This is your job, get on and do it. Uh, it usually is about basically linking to pre-existing, not very web-friendly content. Um, and, uh, and it's usually only happening in an organization because somebody in senior management went, everyone else is doing this, we really ought to do this as well. Uh, so in terms of its effectiveness, I guess that's debatable. Uh, if, if the only uh, measure of success is basically we're online now, uh, then yes, it's sort of, it does that. Uh, in terms of any of the broader senses of potential for these tools, uh, it doesn't do very much and may actually be doing a lot of harm a lot of time. And a few years ago, I would say a few years ago at the ECF, this was much more normal amongst a lot of organizations. And uh, a number of them have moved on beyond. But I guess yeah, the last piece is sort of those values that underpin ha this, this form of social media use, which is basically stability and control. How do we uh, make sure that this stuff doesn't rock the boat too much? How do we slot it into the pre-existing systems and structures that we have, uh, not, let it, not let it disrupt? Uh, the second stage, I think, is going to be a bit more controversial. Uh, I think this is the one where I find most, especially bigger, uh, bigger organizations in these days. Um, it sort of grows out of the frustrations that a lot of people in organizations have with that first stage that I talked about, but this is what I'm calling the social engineering project. Uh, it's usually when an organization develops a specialist digital team, online team mobilization, communication, uh, online communications, what have you, uh, and gets a solid group of people who this is their whole focus. Um, in terms of the practice of it, it's very much about segmentation, uh, targeting, highly managed uh, uh, user journeys, supporter journeys, these kinds of things. Uh, it, it puts us into demographics, it tells us the steps that we're supposed to take in order to be a part of, uh, a part of the organization. And fundamentally, this is part of a kind of a bigger kind of theory of change, which basically says bigger numbers equals better change. And obviously there are certain, there are a lot of arguments in which that can be the case. But I think, I think it it's, seems obvious in some ways, but s social change is inevitably more complex and more isn't always better, uh, particularly if it's, if it's more at the uh, at quantity at the expense of quality. And I think that's something that a lot of our organizations have inadvertently bought into, uh, basically continuing to chase the numbers game, whether it's more petition signatures, whether it's, it's more, more uh, higher click rates, what have you, uh, but always going for more uh, without necessarily thinking as much about like, what are the specific and unique things that the people who care about our cause have to offer? What are the skills and experiences and perspectives that we could be tapping into uh, that are usually not happening on the same scale as the people who will do a collectivist kind of action, but potentially, I think, offer a much deeper and more meaningful sense of connection with our organization and with our cause. Um, the values involved, I think, are probably not that different from the first stage. They're still quite control-focused, quite quantity-focused. These are sort of easily manageable actions. We get people to do things a lot of the time that are the, uh, that, that can be easily slotted into our management systems, that we can put into a spreadsheet, we can, we can count the numbers, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and quantity-based. And, uh, and I think the effectiveness of this, and this may be a debatable thing, I, my, my gut feeling and uh, what I've seen some hints of is that the short-term effectiveness of this stuff can be really useful. We can get kind of, uh, create major, major moments around issues that we care about through these kinds of things. But I worry, and some of you will have seen, I posted something to this effect last week on the, uh, on the ECF list, but I worry that this is the kind of thing that may in fact be eroding our supporter base in terms of their, their deeper involvement with a cause. That we are creating more and more of a precedent that people's value to us is a couple of clicks, rather than people's value to us is the unique, like I said, skills, experiences, perspectives that they could be bringing to, to a movement for change. Uh, and so I worry that we're sacrificing longer-term goals for shorter-term benefits here. Um, and uh, so to move on, this is in a totally self-promotional way, uh, what I've been calling the, uh, the more like people organization. Um, 
And, uh, and this is sort of quite different, and I've seen, sort of seen elements of this emerging in different organizations that I've worked with in recent years, uh, but it's still far from the norm. Uh, the who, who does it is everyone, or as close to everyone as is appropriate or wants to be involved. Basically, that, that ideally there are people all across the organization who are freely tweeting and blogging and posting videos and sharing content, uh, and they don't necessarily have a, uh, a disclaimer at the end of their bios that say views are my own and not those of my employer. There's a sort of a sense that we're all human beings that are a part of a cause and we're gonna do things that, uh, we're gonna share stuff that's important to us and we're gonna post stuff that's important to us. So the tone of it is very often personal, open, funny, responsive, emotive, it's sort of, it's not uh, so much built on the organizational mode of professionalism that I think a lot of our organizations have been, uh, have, have been sort of taking on gradually over the course of the last few decades. The why is also quite different from the other two, two stages that I talked about. The why is very much more that stronger empowered networks are the key to, uh, to the kind of change that we need. Uh, that if we build, build and support and nurture networks, and relationships between people who care about this stuff and offer them opportunities to connect with each other and, and new and creative and individual and autonomous ways of supporting causes that they care about, then that will be, a, that will be an incredibly beneficial thing for, for a broader cause because a, a motivated, empowered, and well-connected network is, is an incredibly powerful force. And that's one of the things that, that got a lot of our organizations into social media to begin with, was seeing that in action and seeing how in a lot of non-organizational settings, people were doing fantastic and, and sort of seemingly uh, impossible things through, uh, through these kinds of self-organized networks. Uh, and so the effectiveness thing, I, I would argue the effectiveness of this is quite high, but maybe it's in a longer term sense, that we don't necessarily see, see it right away and it can be quite hard to measure. It can be hard to tell the difference between doing the stuff that helps seed strong networks uh, and seeing that network grow and develop and then seeing the impact that network has on, the, on a specific issue. So there, there are a lot of variables and a lot of very hard to track complex issues in these situations, which is I think one of the big reasons why a lot of our organizations have shied away from moving so much in this direction. Uh, but the underpinning values are also totally different, I would say, that they're about participation uh, quality over quantity, transparency, openness, autonomy, democracy even. Um, and that, this, that these are quite different to the sort of top-down managerialism uh, that, that I think still dictates a lot of, lot of organizational uh, social media use. Um, so, so that's where I've seen some organizations moving. And I think that's something that offers a lot of hope uh, and offers us a longer-term sense of sustainability through some of this stuff. But um, I think there's a, a fundamental thing here. I, I mean, I can hear some of the, like, these seem like pretty major changes to make in pursuit of 140 characters kind of thing. That like, why would we transform our organizations this deeply over some tweets or uh, over some, some social media accounts, these kinds of things. But fundamentally, I think that what, what social media offers is an inroad for helping us address a lot, a lot, a lot of very deep-seated issues that have been a part of our organizations and have been the background, the backdrop to many of the conversations here at ECF and elsewhere uh, for many, many years. Uh, and that essentially that we've got structures that suck the life out of people a lot of the time. We've got, we've got management practices, we've got sign-off processes, we've got uh, divide, uh, teams and silos that are so divided from one another that we end up feeling so disconnected from our causes a lot of the time. And, and that's, that's a really uh, a massive problem. Uh, I think specifically, uh, I would sort of highlight two, two areas that are uh, uh, as, as especially problematic, and I say those are hierarchy and specialization. Um, and I think these are very much industrial layovers. That these are things that were the defining hallmarks of the Industrial Revolution, really, and that became the building blocks of organizations across all sectors, uh, from, from kind of car, like auto manufacturers to healthcare providers to like firefighting, uh, firefighters to, to NGOs, charities, campaigning organizations. And I think, um, I think it's, uh, it's, these, these are things that have had a really disastrous effect, particularly as they've moved into the NGO world, which 
in the UK, Canada, the US, broadly, and I'm sure elsewhere as well, uh, seem to be a trend that really kicked off in the early 80s. Uh, of sort of the professionalization of our organizations and starting to organize ourselves more like government, more like, the, more like the private sector, and taking on more of the structures that we found in those institutions and putting them to use for our causes. Uh, but I think there, the costs of this are sort of twofold. Uh, I think they're, they're both ethical and pragmatic. Uh, I think they're, they're, the structures we have are at odds with the things that bring most of our organizations together. I don't think most of us agree that a small group of people should be making uh, unrepresentative decisions on be behalf of mass numbers of people, yet almost all of our organizations are built on that premise. Um, and so I think like the ethical side, like I said, the staff side is often that most of us have experienced quite high levels of various moments of demoralization uh, because of the structures that we found ourselves in and the organizational practices that we've been a part of. Also in terms of our communities, supporters, members, beneficiaries, what have you, uh, these structures make it very, a, a lot harder a lot of the time for people to actually come to our organizations and engage with us without finding themselves trapped in a maze of bureaucracy, knowing who they should talk to about what, who can connect them with what information. Um, and that also ties in then to the pragmatic side, um, which I think the sort of the responsiveness question, which is I know one that we've talked about quite, uh, quite extensively throughout these questions and how a lot of our organizational processes uh, get in the way of us being able to respond to what's actually happening in the world, to be knowing who, who should respond when somebody tweets a complaint to our organizational account. These kinds of things that become sort of frustrations for those of us who are on the front lines doing it, um, but actually are, are much bigger problems in terms of how, it, how it, our organizations are reflected in the wider world. It also cuts out perspective though, and I think hierarchy in particular, but also the sort of this siloing that happens with departments and teams uh, also means that perspective is lost, particularly at the highest decision levels, at uh, decision making levels. And so I think there's this whole range of ways in which I think we really do need to reconstruct the ways we organize uh, if we are going to get the most out of social media. Uh, and uh, essentially all of this is what I'd sort of describe as assembly line social change. Uh, and I think that's what's characterized a lot of our organizations since the early 80s. Uh, and that, uh, that it's about plans that are made on high and passed down. It's about no one on the ground really having a sense of the big picture because they're so slotted into a, a particular box of their job description. Uh, it's the broken telephone effect of internal and external communications where the right information isn't able to get where it needs to go. Um, and it's all the massive wastage created by so many compliance systems, whether it's the compliance of managers breathing down staff's neck, uh, what, trying to sign off every tweet or every, every blog post, uh, or whether it's the waste that our funders often uh, spend sort of monitoring and evaluating us against preset criteria that doesn't allow us the flexibility we need uh, or, or give us the trust we need to get on and do important things. Uh, and so perhaps unsurprisingly, um, I think professionalization has been setting our causes back uh, well, giving us the illusion of moving forward. We can kind of, we can measure more than we ever have. We're counting, counting numbers in, in ways we've never imagined we could count numbers before. Uh, but I think we're losing sight of the bigger picture. And that's sort of the thing when I mentioned the, uh, the uh, open space session earlier, the, uh, the ice caps are melting, but our click rates are up. Uh, this sort of lo loss of perspective that I think, I think we need to tackle head on and can't keep allowing to be a sort of a background issue. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think this is hugely problematic, and I realize most of what I've said has been really negative so far. Uh, but there is hope. <laughs> um, this is the approach that I've been taking with a lot of organizations. I've been calling it constructive subversion. Uh, and to be honest, I think it's the most ethical and most effective way I've found of working for organizational change. Uh, it's about not following the systems that are there. It's about finding the cracks and crevices that exist and organizing them to get things done as we know we need to get them done and not waiting on dinosaur systems to catch up with us and thus miss opportunities and miss, miss the ability to influence things that, that we know we need to have a, have a say in. Uh, essentially, it's an alternative 
uh, model of organizational change uh, that doesn't require the turkeys to vote for Christmas, which is how I usually describe getting senior managers to bring about participatory democracy in their organizations. Uh, it, it allows people who are affected by the issues to get on and make them happen without waiting for people who are usually reasonably invested in the status quo to approve, uh, approve the move to do so. Uh, so I've been kind of, just as a, a way of framing it, been going over sort of three stages of constructive subversion. Uh, the first one is one that is very social media heavy. Uh, and it's actually just creating the basis of a new organizational structure that is network based rather than hierarchy based. And it's where you find the people around your organization and often outside your organization as well who are keen on these things, that are frustrated with the way things are, that want to do things differently and want to move forward, but are often feeling incredibly isolated in that process. And I've seen and used Twitter most primarily, but not exclusively, as a really good way of connecting with uh, other people in organizations that I've worked with who have that interest in change, uh, but that have maybe not known what to do with it and thought they were sort of alone in that thinking. So, so the first stage is about networks, and like a big piece of it's online, but it also happens in the pub, and it happens around the water cooler, and it happens in the in-between moments at conferences. Uh, but weaving the networks that essentially starts to form the beginnings of an alternative organizational structure where people are directly connected to one another and can go to, to each other directly when they, want to, uh, when they want to get something done or see something needs doing. Uh, the second bit is conversations, and it's about sort of taking that to a next level. I often sort of uh, encourage or, uh, people within organizations, the kind of the constructive subversives, to, uh, to set up a lunchtime meeting group and call it something totally innocuous, like call it an environment meeting group or call it an innovation working group, an uh, innovation group. Uh, and something that won't bat an eye, for, get a, have an eyelid batting at a senior level. People will just sort of say, okay, that seems like an okay thing that can happen, and we won't try and interfere with it. Uh, and, uh, and use that as a space to actually start discussing, getting beyond the sort of the whinges at the pub, the, the frustration, but actually starting to think like, okay, there's quite a few of us within this organization who want to do things differently. Uh, how are we going to start to do something about that? And start to use like lunchtime or after work or whatever it happens to be as a space to actually talk through what alternatives could look like and how you could take on various little aspects of the systems that are getting in the way in order to start doing things better. And so the third phase sort of moves out of that and it goes from conversations into, okay, we've identified that this policy is a huge problem. We've identified that we really need to do this, that, or the other thing. Uh, how can we start to self-organize in small groups that cut through hierarchy and cut through departments and silos um, and actually starts to get on and make things happen? Um, so those are kind of broadly the kind of the three steps that I've been sort of working with some organizations around and encouraging people to take on. Um, but uh, essentially, this is, the stuff, uh, this, is, this is the stuff that I think gets to it uh, towards the more like people organization. And uh, <laughs> this is, uh, I, I don't know if any of the rest of you do this. I sometimes do Google image searches for random phrases. Uh, this is when you look up professional on Google images and the amount of awful, awful crap that, that comes up. There was one of them earlier as well of just those awful images that, that like somebody's been paid to make and it's just, it's, it's hideous that that's the case. Uh, <laughs> I think the thing with this one is like everything about it is so contrived with this guy in the middle. His tie, like, I think there, it must be like a rock solid tie that's been made to look like it's in motion. <laughs> anyway, I, I sometimes like to abuse these kinds of images and, and uh, yeah, uh, put them up there for just a sort of the contrast of, of what I'm trying to, uh, to fight against. But broadly, a kind of a more like people organization is uh, something, an organization that's changing in terms of its structures, its behaviors, its practices. It's changing both all of us at an individual level within it, shifting the ways we do things, and in the process, starting to shift the structures and, and the practices that we're a part of within our institutions. Um, it supports people to be themselves, to not feel like they have to put a disclaimer on their accounts that say these are the views of, my, uh, of uh, myself, not my employer, and these kinds of things that, that create real restrictions against us feeling like we can be honest and open in our work. Uh, it's an organization that supports uh, diversity, flexibility, creativity, autonomy. Uh, it trusts people to get on and do things differently. Um, but uh, 
Essentially, what I think all of this means is social media will only really help us campaign better if it helps us to organize better. And I think that's a question I think that uh, sh could be underpinning a lot more of, uh, of, of the discussions that are, that are filtering around in here and more widely. Uh, and I think actually getting to, do, getting to that point, uh, there, I mean, I think there are so many ways that social media can help us to do that, potentially. Uh, I've talked about subverting the hierarchy and just being able to find the people you need to get things done. Breaking down silos, similarly. Uh, finding the people, whoever they are, even if they're in a team or department you wouldn't normally work with at all. Uh, improving internal communications where people, again, are not sort of relegated to kind of going up to their manager who goes across to another manager who passes something down to someone else in order to get something basic done that would have taken five minutes. Um, Becoming more transparent, more of our conversations and our discussions and our decisions happening out in the open in public spaces where, where we, we don't have to have sort of behind closed doors sort of secretive meetings about everything. But a lot of things can happen in an open way which can build a wider sense of public trust in what we do. Uh, it can blur the internal and external lines, giving people from outside the organization more clear inroads into the organization, knowing how they can be a part of meetings. There's a, there's a, uh, a, a social lab in the US called Creating the Future, who, uh, who do something uh, with all their board meetings where they're all live streamed on the internet. And, uh, and so basically, anybody is free to join, and anyone can Skype in if they want to contribute in one way or another. And basically, they're like, we've got nothing to hide. Uh, and we know there's a massive wealth of knowledge out there that couldn't be in the room with us today. So why the hell wouldn't we? Um, it allows us to grow resilient networks. I've talked about that a little bit already and how, how sort of network-based systems, and this ties into some of Zaid's comments yesterday morning as well, but the, the resilience that's created when you don't have everything running through a central, a central point. Uh, but that it, complex systems are connected directly to each other as, at as many different points as possible. And, uh, and so rather than having to go up through the, the pyramid, we can go directly to one another. Uh, it harnesses latent creativity. The number of people I find in organizations every day who are so stuck in their job descriptions but have so many more things to offer and have so many more things they're interested in but haven't been free enough to kind of pursue those. Uh, and uh, become more responsive to the world around us, which is sort of obvious. It's something that, that we've been talking about a lot yesterday and today. And, uh, and, but I think the fundamental thing is that it gives us a chance to live our values in the way that we, we do our work. And I think that's something fundamentally that I think we re need to reconnect with. I think there's a bit of an unspoken kind of the ends justify the means mantra that's sort of come along in parallel with the sort of the professionalization of a lot of our organizations uh, that have meant developing some quite and I've, I mean, I've come across some awful examples I won't get into, but some deeply unethical practices across organizations that are supposed to be built around social ethical causes. And I think that's something fundamental that will undermine us really, really in, in some serious fundamental ways uh, in the longer term, both in terms of staff and people internally as well as public perceptions and people externally. Uh, so I think this is something that, that needs to be not a back burner conversation, but actually thinking about like, if we believe in transparency and openness and democracy, what does that mean for how we make certain decisions? What does that mean for how we develop and organize campaigns? What does that mean for the ways we get, uh, involve people in the work that we do? Uh, so I want to end on a, um, on a, on a quote from, uh, from Howard Zinn, uh, which he applies to kind of society more widely. Uh, but I think also could apply to a lot of, lot of our organizations. Uh, and he says, civil disobedience is not our problem. Our problem is civil obedience. And I think, the, I guess I would just sort of follow on with that, that all these kinds of changes that I've been talking about, all, they rarely happen in organizations because somebody has asked nicely and has gone through writing the right proposal and asked, gone through the formal channels and waited for approval. Uh, they happen because people get on and do things. And that can be uncomfortable and it can be risky, but it's the only way we're going to get to, uh, to the kinds of organizations I think we all have the potential to be a part of. So uh, thank you. And uh, I'm really keen to, to see where you want to go with the conversation from here. <laughs> <laughs>